Okay, we're now going to be talking about fans and pneumatics. How many of you got fans and pneumatic noise issues? <coughs> what sort of issues have you got? All of them. <laughs> Can it be a tad more specific? <laughs> Yeah. Pneumatics is, are we, we're running high pressure air, and I'm not talking, we're talking 300, 400 bar, not PSI, Yeah. so it's it's not your standard. So um, it's, it's pretty high pressure. Yeah, it's yeah. proper high pressure air. And where's the noise coming from? Exhausts or? Exhaust stumps, actually testing, yeah. testing the pneumatics, so we actually have a room called pneumatics. Um, and it's the, it's the testing of each stage when yeah. they dump the air out of each test and, and that kind of thing, that's when you get it. Right. Any idea of noise levels? Actually, in the room's not too bad. It's specific tests within the room yeah. where, where we've got where we've yeah. got noise. So it's, it's one of those where it dis, it, it dissipate quite quickly. So it's not hearing protection in there. It's not actually above 85, but it's, it's stood at each station. You can get above right. 85. Okay. You said fans as well, you say? We've all got motors and fans and yeah. extract, yeah. 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 transport, yeah. 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 transport fans. Yeah, yeah. Could, um, conveyor systems which have got resources on it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so ask questions as we go through this. Um, fan system noise control options. Um, <coughs> conventionally, you do silencing, enclosures, lagging, barriers, and building modifications for fans. Um, those are all can all be very effective and they may be best practice. But what we've done is we've introduced an extra layer of um, aerodynamic noise control. Because one of the interesting things about fans, the <coughs> fan is running at optimum efficiency, it's also running at its quietest. So what we do is a bit like Formula One, where they have all these little aerodynamic aids on their cars to make them go faster and the rest of it. We do the same thing with fan installation systems. Because it's not just the fan itself, it's also the way it's installed affect efficiency and can affect the noise dramatically. So we look at the whole thing and we go, okay, what can be done to improve this? And that can make a massive difference to noise and also can improve efficiency, as I'll show you. So again, it's like the other times of noise control, the ideal is to do source control using aerodynamics. If you can't do that, you fall back on silencers and enclosures and lagging and all the rest of it. Um, one of the problems with silencers is hygiene. You can buy hygienic silencers, but it's difficult because even with hygienic silencers, you have it depends on your cleaning requirements. Because if you imagine, I'll show you a typical silencer and you'll see, you'll see why. Um, whereas the aerodynamic noise control has no implications for hygiene at all. So let's look at fan installations. Centrifugal fan, okay, which means that the air goes out tangentially, goes in the center without tangentially. One of the classics is you put a right angle bend on the intake. What it means is you get reverse flow on the intake, and that means the fan is running much less efficiently. And also, as far as the fan is concerned, it's got high pressure and low pressure air, so each fan blade is going around and it's making it tone and it makes it much more noisy. Um, what you need is straight duct in. So if you're looking at the installation, and to be fair, quite often you get a uh, fan installation is supposed to be a straight duct. But when they were doing the install, they said, oh, I can't bug your four-wheel truck past there, so turn the fan to 90 degrees and put a bend on it. And then you've got noise. So it means for the enclosure or silence or whatever is required. So one of the key things is two to three duct arms are straight duct into any fan. So here's a couple of cases. This is an enormous two-point something meter fan, right angle bend, and some movers, some dampers. So the flow going to the fan is horrible, which means the fan is less efficient, which means you have to run it faster, and it makes a lot more, lot more energy, yes. That's the other thing. It's carbon. This is a centrifugal fan, and again, they put the dampers on the fan outlet. Now, a centrifugal fan, the air going around the outside is probably doing three or four times the velocity of the air going around the inside. Further down, the duct, two or three duct dampers further down, Lost is the same everywhere. And fan noise is proportional to the fifth power of fan speed. So what it means is a slight increase in velocity, air velocity has a massive effect on noise. So what they've done is they've put the disturbance of the airflow as in the highest possible flow condition. 
So it means it generates the maximum possible noise. If you move this up to here, you're probably going to get 6 to 9 dBA reduction in broadband noise because of that. Is Just bad design. Is there a calc for that? I think there was a pneumatics number of pipe diameters before. <coughs> um, pneumatics, I'll come to pneumatics in a minute. Um, but, but normally, when you do a, a, a nice free bend, you normally you say you have so many pipe diameters before. You ideally want two to three duct diameters, a straight duct between anything that causes disturbance in the flow and the fan intake. That's, a, that's, a, that's our rule of thumb, just a crude rule of thumb. So axial flow fans, propeller bladed fans, that's quite often the end of the duct. And you get a massive turbulence around the corner, there's a bell mouth. It makes the fan a lot more efficient and reduces the noise. Fitting bell mouth to the one at Farnborough, not the noise by 6 dBA, and the fan could be run 20% slower to get the same flow. It just makes the fan more efficient and reduces <coughs> Um, flexible connectors in ducts don't have as close as possible to fan intake, and also make sure they're not they're tight, so you get minimum disturbance to flow. Also, dampers don't put them close to fan intake. Let's say two to three duct diameters between anything like a bend, damper, anything, and the fan intake straight duct to allow any to allow turbulence to settle out. That means the fan will be running efficiently and at minimum noise. If you've got speed controllers, which these days they're much cheaper than they used to be, you can usually turn the fan down, which saves you energy as well. <coughs> so that's a general, simple general rule for, for getting fan installations as efficient as possible. <coughs> this is conventional splitter answer. And what you're doing is you're splitting the duct up into a number of slots lined with acoustic absorption. So, because you're putting in acoustic absorption to the flow, that takes up cross-sectional area. So, normally what you do is you have your fan duct, it then expands, then you have a sensor, and then it contracts. Now, as far as that's concerned, <coughs> put my one hole coming down. Say you have a duct and you line that with acoustic absorbent. That's got a cross sectional air cave. So air and noise is travelling down that duct. <laughs> if you have acoustic absorbent around, some of the noise goes to the acoustic absorbent. So, so you, you get maybe two decibels per metre attenuation, something like that. If you make that Same cross section area, but a rectangle a slot, much more surface area. Maybe you're getting 10 dB per meter attenuation. So that's the principle of one of these sciences. You split the duct up into lots of slots, like the acoustic absorbance, you get quite high attenuation per, per, per length. But you do have to expand the duct and then contract the duct. And one of the bad things that people do is the expansion is too quick. You must have an included angle less than 14 degrees. Otherwise, you get turbulence, you get losses. Less than 14 degrees and less than 14 degrees. But that means it's got to be long, because if you've got the expansion, it's got to be gradual. So in other words, you need quite a lot of space to get a sensor like this if it's in a duct. It's, yeah. It's on the outlet to a duct, you just have an expansion and then just freely outlet. Um, so this is usually a rock wall or fiberglass, and it's got perforated sheet steel on it. Now, you can get hygienic crystals or film faced and support rest of it, but you've still got the perforations on it. So in a lot of circumstances you can't afford a build up of stuff in the perforations. You need a smooth surface and you also can't get access to this to clean it inside. Um, and you can get quite a lot of build up. There was one many, many, many years ago. There was a uh, company in Birmingham uh, who made gold jewellery, big big company, you know, a lot of stuff. And they had sciences and they clogged up eventually, so they happened to replace them. And this company was replacing them for free. And you know, getting the gold out of them. Yeah, getting the gold out of them. Exactly. Exactly <laughs> right. So that's a problem. It's the hygiene. You have to be much more careful about the design of, of sciences. So that's the attenuation for a splitter sciencer. And as you might expect, what we've got here is again an octave band. 
150 millimeter slots and 100 millimeter slots. So the narrower the slot, the higher the attenuation, but the more the back pressure. And the bigger the slant has to be if you want to reduce the back pressure in terms of tip diameter. So <clears throat> for 150 millimeter slots, nothing at low frequencies, pretty reasonable performance in the mid frequency range, and then at higher frequencies, you're getting less performance. Because the air, the noise just goes straight down the channel, it's directional. The narrow slots can get much more performance in the mid to high frequency range. But again, you get higher back pressure. So one of the issues with sensors is, even with very careful design, the manufacturer can provide you with flow rates and pressure drops. And what it means is your efficiency of your system will fall. Um, you want to keep that to a minimum, because in some cases, <coughs> they haven't got much space, so they fit. A high performance sensor has got quite high back pressure. So they fit that, and that solves the problem, but they haven't got enough flow, so they speed the fan up, which makes it noisier. So you're running up and down escalator a bit. So, you have, so our approach is to look at the system and say, how do we make this as efficient as possible, especially these days with, with variable frequency drives are much, much cheaper, you can save power. So if you can slow the fan speed down a bit, you get a big benefit in terms of noise. This is a circular duct, same sort of principle. You line the inside of the duct with a viscous absorbent, so you've got just a duct line. So it's a slightly larger diameter than, than the duct, so you don't get any constriction. But performance isn't that good. You can increase performance by putting a pod in the middle, which is full of acoustic absorbent. So looking down it, this one was doing zero because it's all clogged. If you get, once you get clogged, it's the sound can't get into the acoustic absorption, so it doesn't work. And you'd be amazed at how many silences we look into. Or you don't necessarily have to do much. Quite often they just fall apart because they rot. If you look inside, there's nothing. No rock wall, no perfect. It's all rotted and disappeared into the product sometimes, in this feeding the product, or into the atmosphere. So they don't last forever, so check the internals of your sciences. This is circular sciences, much less performance than spitter sciences, so nothing at low frequencies, modest at mid frequencies. If you stick a pod in the middle, you get much better with the high frequency performance, but at the expense of pressure drop. One of the issues of sciences as well, is you get cases where, oh, what you, all you need, small fan on the roof, all you need is a sensor costing 600 quid, and the installation cost is five grand. You steel work and a crane. By the time we've done all that, shut the road, it costs you an awful lot of money. And you know, this is a bit silly, you know, 600 quid sensor, it's on the roof, it's awkward. Hmm. Another form of sensor is what those are called um, absorptive sensors. You get a reactive sensor. Have you ever burned across the top of a bottle? Let me drink a bit of this to see if I can uh, demonstrate. No, not very good one. I think I've got a narrow neck. <coughs> but you all blown across the top of a beer bottle. Yeah. yeah. And you get what? This is a noise. Yeah. Uh, you get yeah. comments from your friends who find it very annoying. Um, you get tone, don't you? And the frequency of that tone depends on how much the beer you drunk. Mm -hmm. Or rather, how much you've left. And the, the thickness of the glass? Is it not very It's the dimensions of the inside of the bottle. Oh, right now. Okay. How much beer is actually tuning? That's called a Helmholtz resonator sensor, beer, beer type. Um, if you were to screw that bottle into the side of a duct down which that tone is travelling from the fan, you can knock that tone out by maybe 20 to 40 dB. Very, very efficiently, it cancels the sound out. It's a very high attenuation, but it's a very narrow frequency band. If the frequency of fan load changes significantly, the frequency changes a bit, you'll lose all the attenuation. So it's very good for a fixed frequency, very, very fixed. And this is an example of a grain trial with a blower transporting grain. <coughs> so try switching it off. So it's about 17 dB off that tone. But it's very specific because it's got K-tin sized copies, but it's very specific to a single frequency, it doesn't take anything else. 